Hello, this is the next instalment in this series of podcasts around the OAM, or Ogham, the Irish alphabet, however you prefer to pronounce it. Uh, we've done um, the first five letters, each one with its own podcast. So this is an overview of those whole five as a connected set. But excuse the throat, I'm nearly choked to death on a sweet earlier. <laughs> It'll teach me to eat sweets. We've been using this cheesy cardboard um, visual aid beforehand. Each of the letters comes in a set of five. So there are four sets of five, that's per the uh, cardboard windmill thing there. Each of those sets is called an echma. An echma is one of the old words for a tribe, so uh, like a, a group of people. Um, so these are the four tribes, four tribes of the, um, the alphabet. Now it's possible if you approach this just as a linguist and you simply think in terms of um, this is an alphabet for straightforward communication and nothing more mystical than that, then these are just sets of letters. <coughs> There's no great uh, meaning or significance to those sets. <coughs> Excuse me. However, that would make for a rather short video if we just viewed this as a, um, a relatively meaningless thing. I mean, the first five podcasts, we've taken the approach of this having lots of symbolism, lots of metaphor, lots of uh, deeper imagery and representing spiritual lessons, life lessons, ways of understanding the world, ways of organizing knowledge. <coughs> and what Witka Wittgenstein refers to as a, a language frame, a way of um, shaping our reality, forming our reality. There's a German sociologist, uh, Max Weber, who talked about Verstein, which is how we understand the world, and that we have different frames, different ways of understanding the world in different cultures, different parts of the world, different religions and politics and all that sort of business. And so this is a way, so not the only way, but it is a way of understanding the world and organizing knowledge around the world through the, the, um, the lens, the structure, provided by this set of 20 letters. So I'm going to suggest that there is a, a, a symbolic connection between each of the four sets, each of the four echma. The letters within that set are connected to each other in some way. So for this first set, um, another cheap visual aid. Here we go. So we start with Bech, Lush, Fjarn, Solja, Nun. The first five. So Bech is birth, the birch, beginning, start. We could, I suppose, think of it as conception. But I'm, I'm going to suggest that maybe what the um, ancients thought of in terms of the imagery and the metaphor and the poetic symbolism and so on associated with the birch tree is not so much the act of conception, two souls coming together, but the actual birth at the end of the, the nine months of human pregnancy. So the child comes into the world, it enters fresh, enters new. Now, one of the images, images we mentioned in the uh, first pod podcast we did on this is the, the use of the birch, birch rods, the, the thinner bits of the branch, for um, beating the bounds, um, for unfortunately, rather graphically, whipping criminals and, and uh, naughty children and that sort of thing. Uh, and the idea that beating something with birch sticks is going to purge it, cleanse it, drive out things that should no longer be there. And obviously if we're talking um, you know, whipping criminals or at one stage where it was not uncommon uh, quite gruesomely to um, beat the mentally ill in the notion that they were only mentally ill because they had been possessed by spirits and this, this act of beating would sort of drive out the, men the, out the spirits causing the mental illness, which thankfully we don't want to do not at least in any of the countries I'm aware of at any rate, we don't do that anymore. Um, that sense that there is something here which should not be here and it's moved away. Now, I'm, I'm trying not to make a direct comparison between the act of giving birth and the act of exercising demons, because it, uh, that's a bit of a bleak image, but the notion that uh, the spirits are in the person and uh, they don't want them to be in the person, so they put them out. The spirits don't die, they just go somewhere else. And obviously um, the, the um, unborn child is in the mother's womb, 
and it reaches the point where it can no longer stay in the mother's room, womb is getting far too big, etc, etc, it's ready to be born, it moves from the mother out into the world. And it, it's that act of moving a force from place A to place B that I want to suggest is um, one of the, the, the kind of uh, central metaphors of B. And so if you're doing readings or you are using it for an aid for chanting or whatever it might be that you're doing, um, part of the underlying notion is that the, the um, mental state it represents is one in which you're seeking to move a force from a place you don't want it to be into some other place where you presumably do want it to be in, in sort of the moving out. Which I suppose is always worth bearing in mind if, if you are doing something on the, the slightly grimmer side, you know, casting out spirits, which is a practice in, in many, many, many religions. Where do you cast them to? It's not just enough to get them out of person A, you've got to think about where they go next. Or, you know, dispelling negative forces and that sort of thing. That's something that um, I've heard quite a few pagans doing and talking about. Um, where does it go once you've dispelled it from the place you don't want it in anymore? It's something to think about. Yeah. So, birth. Leaving the womb, entering into the world, going from place A to place B. And obviously, the, the with the notion of birth, you're going from a very small world to a much bigger world. So you're entering into something quite big. And you can see that not just at birth, but you could, obviously there's lots of situations in life as you get older where you move from a confined situation to a much bigger situation. So that could be um, you know, leaving home for the first time to go out into the big wide world. So you're leaving the, the containment, the room, if you like, of the family to go out into the big wide world. Um, or somebody who leaves, graduates university and goes out looking for a job. So they're, they're going from this world into a much bigger world. So that not only birth in the, the actual sense of the word, but all sorts of other forms of um, transition to a bigger world that take place in human life. But for the moment, we'll stick to the imagery of actual birth. From there, we move to Lush, sometimes the Rowan, but also um, fire. Um, sorry, the, particularly the notion of a healing fire or a fire that people are drawn to rather than a fire that harms, but a fire that is a, a positive force. Um, and the, the lush, the healing herb, the herbs of healing, which can be any type of herb that's used for healing. How we understand that as a second step? Well, one of the strong images associated with the Rhone and the lush is that of St. Bridget, on the Bridget Bridge's cross. Um, and then through her with Breed, the goddess, the pagan goddess, or Brigantia, as she's referred to in um, British and continental sources, the high one, the exalted one. One of the images uh, linked, and this is a bit tenuous, I'll grant you, but one of the images linked to um, Brige, the saint, St. Bridget, is that she was the wet nurse um, of uh, a midwife and wet nurse of Jesus. Now, if St. Bridget ever existed at all as a, an actual flesh and blood human woman, then she was quite a few centuries after the birth and death of Jesus. But as you know, this kind of, uh, you know, um, what can we call it, magical thinking that goes on in hagiographies and um, mythology and so on, where such mere details of actually being on the same planet at the same time in history slightly go out the window because there's a deeper imagery that why was the abbess Bridget thought to be, after her death, the uh, midwife and wet nurse of Christ, um, when clearly she couldn't possibly have been? I'd suggest that maybe this was picking up a much older imagery associated with a pagan goddess, rather than with the Christian saint and the two, just because the convergence of name had sort of blended together into this um, unifying myth that doesn't really make an awful lot of historical sense, but captures a spirit of what people understood. So perhaps the, the, the goddess <coughs> was seen as a, a guardian, a protector, a, a matron um, of midwives, of wet nurses, of people involved in those sorts of um, trades, professions, whatever the word would be, vocations perhaps, uh, the nurturer, the container. And she's certainly a goddess much linked to the homestead and uh, the farm animals on the homestead and guarding the homestead and she's a 
French warrior goddess who blended into that Roman imagery of Britannia. Um, why do we go to war? Well, if it's not to protect the home, then what is the point, in a sense? Because we're not really looking at empire builders at this point in time, this point in, in culture. Other cultures certainly are very, very imperial. But the, um, the various tribes of Ireland or the tribes of Britain uh, were not in the business of trying to set up huge international empires and conquering land and going to war for the sheer you know, glory of expanding the kingdom and expanding the empire. When they went to war, it was a bit of cattle raiding mostly and um, defending their own territory, improving the resources of small scale territory. Ultimately, you could say to um, to defend and um, better better support the home. And there is that sense of uh, all the way through to you know, songs in the First World War about keep the home fires burning. That what's the what are, are the, the young men going to war for? Well, to protect their homeland, and at the end of the day, if they survive the war, they want to come back to home. And there is, well, tons of letters written by soldiers at all points in history, in, in all countries, where they're writing home and, and very much talk about how much they miss home and, and you know, the significance of home to them. Uh, but that's why they're involved in the military life. So um, Brigantia, as this um, goddess with a military aspect, or the warrior woman aspect, is more about, I would suggest, defending the home than about imperialism and expansionism and so forth. Uh, she, she is the guardian of the hearth, of the fires of the hearth as the fire goddess. So that is the imagery working with her. So convolutedly, I'm assuming we're going from Bech, birth, to the next stage, being nurtured, being looked after, being protected. So the, the midwife, the wet nurse, the one who enables the birth, who, who brings the child forth and then feeds it, looks after it, nurtures it. Now obviously um, wet nurses are, are really a thing of the upper classes. Um, poor women breastfed their own kids. And I, I don't see those cases where uh, for whatever medical reason a, a poor woman was not able to breastfeed her own child. There may be some, some relative next door neighbour would have stepped in to help, but not a professional wet nurse per se, just you know, a, a sister, a cousin or someone who would say, well, I'll, I'll help keep your child, your infant fed and alive and so forth, rather than doing it for money. But professional paid wet nurses are a thing of the upper classes. But then so is the alphabet, a thing of, an, of the upper classes, the educated, the literary classes. So this is coming from that kind of social background. So as a force, it is one that nurtures the weak, the vulnerable, the... Um, those who are not capable of nurturing themselves as yet, that they are re reliant and dependent upon a protective benevolent force to help them in their transition from world, uh, world A to World B and then nurture them whilst they're still very weak and they're vulnerable and they've yet to become strong enough to look after themselves. So it is a, a kind of a, what should we say, a maternal force, a protective force a nurturing force and in, in, in readings and so forth, or again, chanting and, and, and all of that. Um, what you perhaps be looking towards is a, a force that represents the aid needed by the very frail, the very weak, the very vulnerable, those who need nurture and protection, at least for a period of their life, in some cases perhaps the entirety of their life, but generally speaking, a period of their life when they're, they're not yet strong enough to do these things for themselves. Which leads us into Fjan. So I'm going to go back to the crappy um, aid. Fjan, there we go. Um, met at number three, which is the, the alder tree, which much associates with Bran in Welsh mythology, even though this is an Irish system. Um, uh, and the use of alder wood uh, as a very, very water resistant wood in it drinks up a lot of water in marshlands and bogs and so forth. Uh, certainly if you've got very boggy soil, the, the alder tree is a good one to plant because it will help dry your soil out uh, and will thrive in that sort of socky, murky bit of your garden or wherever it is that you're planting a tree. Um, there's that lovely quote which we mentioned in one of the earlier podcasts from the, the story of Bran the Blessed when he is leading his warriors into Ireland to try and rescue his much abused sister Branwen, that uh, they need to cross 
the Great River Liffey, and the, the bridges have been burned and destroyed, and they've got no, no other way across. And Bran is so huge, he's got a giant of a man, a, of a giant of a god, and he lays across the whole length of the river, or, or the width rather of the river, I should say, um, with his feet on one bank and his hands out on the other bank, and his men and their horses and their wagons and their what have you roll across his back, and he says that quote about that he who would be king be a bridge. And then the use of um, alderwood to build bridges, particularly the pylons that go into the water itself, because it doesn't rot and it stays there for an awful long time. Uh, and as an example of, of alder being used in bridges across very um, swampy, murky areas and walkways and platforms across swampy, murky areas for that very water resistant idea. So the force that crosses. So we're going from quite a maternal force with Lush. Um, the her wife, the midwife, the, the, the wet nurse, towards a more masculine force, towards Bran, towards the, the king, towards the, the enabler guards and protects and shields. And one of the uh, word organs, the Birad organs, is about um, the use of shielding, the use of the wood to make shields in battle. Uh, because again, it's very strong, it's very tough wood. So what I'm seeing here is a kind of maternal force and a paternal force, and that paternal force is um, like a bridge where, you, again, you cross over, it helps you across. The child is a little bit older, a little bit more independent, you know, maybe a, a, a toddler, they're, they're learning to talk, they're learning to walk, they're becoming a bit more independent, a bit more adventurous, they're going out there, they're wandering away from the, the um, swaddling arms of their wetness, and they're off starting in a very small scale way to explore the world and the father figure um, just as the mother nurtures the father is an enabler is ways one that helps the child to stand on its own two feet to learn to do things for itself um, learning to um, engage in activities and you know, make tools and uh, skills that will be useful to the child when it's grown up um, so it's it's about n not nurturing in a kind of um, straightforward care way but pushing towards independence, pushing that child, that, that vulnerable being, could, could actually be an adult, not just a child, um, towards standing into independence, learning to do things for itself, learning to imitate and emulate those who can. So it's, it's what psychologists call social learning theory, where you watch somebody else do something and then like the, the, the kid who pretends to shave when they're watching dad shaving. So they're learning a skill by imitating it and participating and then it becomes second nature when they reach the age where they can actually shave or do whatever it is that they want to do. So they're picking up and absorbing knowledge through observation, through participation, but of people they admire, of people they look up to, of people they like and they trust. Uh, and, and so Fian is that trusted kind of father or uncle or grandfather or what have you, who is helping and shifting the child into independence and um, crossing the bridge to stand on their own two feet, become a more independent force. And um, you could get all Freud about water resistance, or Jungian did about water resistance, developing strength to cope with intense emotions and not drown or be pulled down or rotted away by the intensity of emotion. So to be surrounded by emotion but not decayed by emotion. That could get all a bit Jungian there. Um, that brings us into Solya. The next one on this, there we are. Um, the willow tree. And the willow tree is um, understood in a whole variety of ways. Um, can be understood as, the, as the, the modern day willow tree, the weeping willow, which is a, a, an import from China relatively recently, a few centuries ago, has lots of imagery around grief and the kind of the droopy sad branches and so on, and stories about mourning lovers and, and kind of weeping for their lost love. But the earlier image, if we look at the the kind of um, word oems that those little poetic kennings, those little sentences associated with the arm. Um, some of them talk about uh, honey and they talk about the, the work of bees and that is what I want to pick up on here because honey and bees, bees are a hive, well obviously they're a hive creature most of them, there are solitary bees but the sort of bee we're talking about is the one that lives in the hive, in other words community, 
everyone pulling together and if you all pull together what you get at the end of it is sweet honey uh, the good things in life if you like that are the sweetness and the joy of of a, an organized structured community in which everyone does their bit no one is loafing or bumming around or mooching off others everyone's pulling their own weight and has found out what they're good at doing and they go out and do it so it's that sense of what can I call it, sort of vocation, knowing where you fit into society. Well, I'm really good at this thing. I'll go and do that thing. And that's useful for other people. It's useful for me. I am a productive member of society. Finding your place in the wider community. So again, we're thinking someone's still quite young. And okay, an apprentice, perhaps. Someone who's learning skills, learning useful things, finding where they fit into the bigger picture, where they fit into society. So I suppose we could say education to an extent. Um, more in the old-fashioned sense of education, of like an apprenticeship, rather than the, the modern-day understanding of education. And becoming part of not just your immediate family, mum, dad and the dog, but of a bigger picture of the, of the tribe itself, being out there in the hive, in the tribe, participating, communicating, taking part, um, being a useful member. There is also the association with um, the colour in which there is... Uh, one of the phrases is colour of a lifeless one, colour of a corpse. That kind of goes well with the droopy weepy willow, doesn't it, really? But implicit in all of this is a sense that as you grow up, for every joy at realising you, you can climb a tree, you can swim across the river, you can do this, you can do that, achievement and success and feeling strong and independent and so on. With that, there's always an undertone of a little bit of grief in that as you grow up, you're moving forward and as you're moving forward you're leaving behind and so the intimacy and the coziness and the warmth and the love and affection you're of dependency and of infancy and so forth you're leaving it a little behind and a little behind and a little behind so a little somewhat like that idea in ancient Rome where when children came of age they would uh, make offerings of the toys and the clothes and so forth of their childhood and kind of like burning the past in a sense, putting the past away from themselves to move forward. And as much as they might enjoy their newfound independence, there's always that little bit of grief, I think, and a little bit of sorrow and mourning about what has been left behind. A kind of a, a, a wistful nostalgia for the past of leaving your childhood behind you. And I think there is an undertone of that in the Solia, a little bit of, of, yes, the future is good, but also a little bit of sadness of leaving the past behind you and moving forth into a new new era which finally finishes us with moon the last one there the fifth letter um, which is usually translated as ash though it doesn't really mean ash tree as such um, the, the meaning we ran with there's possible meanings but the one we ran with in the um, earlier podcast was forked stick like a stang uh, uh, a stick with uh, the, the thumb bit on it and the, the two bits like that so you put your thumb in the bit and you walk along as you're climbing up a mountain or climbing up a hill or even walking on the flat it's there to support you as you go so kind of again picking up rather like um well, we've got uh, Lush the nurturing wet nurse and, and Fian, the uh, uncle father figure who is nurturing you forward, and Solia, the community that you are part of, you look after them, they look after you. Noon, the stick you lean upon, again, it's, it's, there's a theme here of um, support, shall we say, of being looked after and doing a little bit of looking after yourself, but mostly being looked after, um, being vulnerable, being weaker, and needing the support of stronger, more protective forces to help through life. So that that um, cleft stick that you use to get yourself up the mountainside as you go along in life um, is the thing you rely on. It's the strength, uh, the support, and so it's going out into the world. But also the the idea of a a cleft stick, a fork stick, is I think symbolic of the road. That you walk along the straight road and then you get to a junction, T junction, a crossroads, whatever shape junction it is. And at that junction you have to make a choice. Do I go north, south, east or west? Do I go left or right? Do I go this way or that way? And that is a metaphor for life in general. That we are constantly faced with choices. Do I do this or do I do that? Some of those choices are very, very trivial. Do I 
have a cup of coffee or do I have a cup of tea? Does it make any great deal of difference one way or the other? Probably not. Um, whereas other choices are very, very major choices in our lives and occasionally they have a major impact on other people's lives. Um, where if you do the right thing, something fantastic happens, but if you do the wrong thing, something dreadful happens. And, and things are ruined or spot or people die or whatever whatever befalls. So they become big um, critical incidences in life. And I think this is symbolic of that as the last of the five, the last of this first echma. I see it almost as the kind of the leaving home, the adventurer. They've, they've grown up, they've nurtured, they're on the verge of adulthood. And a bit like um, the hobbits in Lord of the Rings, they're about to leave the Shire and go out into the wider world. And I don't know what the hell that wider world is going to be like. I've got no experience of it. This is a big trip, a big adventure. Leaving home, going, moving away, going to university or college or a first job or whatever the other thing is. Going away for the first time into the unknown. And this is the, the strength you take with you, the staff, the walking stick, is all of the knowledge and the emotional intelligence and the, the courage and the knowing you've got maybe family you can turn to back home who will help you if it all goes tits up. But all of those good things that you have brought forward from the past into your new life that take you forward on the journey of life and help you make hopefully the correct choices when you are faced with that split in the road where you could go this way or you could go some other way. And you, and you have to use your native wit and past experience and whatnot to make those judgments and those decisions. So we go from beginning Beich, the new life, through childhood, being a toddler, growing up, getting a pet member of a wider community, you know, bonding with your neighbours, your cousins, uh, people down the road. And then one day, like that sort of Iron Age hobbit, if we can think of it in that way. They they walk to the um, the gateway, the portal, through the palisades in the Iron Age village, out onto the road for an adventure, to go and see what the world is like, find out what lies beyond the fence, what lies beyond the palisade, what is on the other side of the known bounds of your childhood world as you enter into adulthood and whatever the future may hold and all the decisions that come with that. Um, integral to that, nearly finished, integral to that you've got all the references to the flight of women and the checking a piece in the, the uh, little poetic verses. Um, we spoke in the podcast about those Irish myths where um, the, the groups of, of uh, the heroes' wives are kind of like the is it wags or whatever they say, footballers. Wives and girlfriends, wives, isn't it? Um, they're kind of competing with each other for who's the most beautiful, who's the most glamorous, who's the most this, the most that. And there's a comedic bit in the story where the husbands are all competing with each other and the wives are all competing with each other and it all gets a bit silly towards the end. That as you go out into the big wide world, there is competition. Competition for jobs, competition for university places, competitions for girlfriends and boyfriends and, and whatever else it is you want in life. That you are not the only one anymore that you have to compete with whatever it is you find out there and establish your identity. Find out in what ways are you better than somebody else at something and in what ways are you not as good as somebody else at something. Uh, and find your place in this bigger, much bigger pecking order than you've ever been used to in your own little home life, your own little village life. Um, and so part of those choices is going to be you know, what job, what girlfriend, what boyfriend, what college course, what this, what that, um, all, all the big choices in life about what to do and um, how you, competition is in a sense about impressing other people, isn't it? It's about making your mark in the world and doing it in a positive way so you leave a good mark rather than a skid mark in the world, um, so you, you make a, a positive statement. So there's an element of all of that. And then that leads on to the sixth letter, which is the first of a new batch of Echman, the next batch of Echman. So the sixth letter is Oath, the Hawthorn, or Terror, if you prefer. But I'm going to leave that for another time. We'll just finish recording this one. Again, usual old thing, if you've got any questions, feedback, hopefully constructive feedback, um, do put it out there. And if I can answer any of those questions by podcast or by um, typed answers on email or Facebook or whatnot, then I'll do so. Thank you.